Okay, uh, hello and welcome to the Label Verification Webinar, Protecting Your Brand with Codmex, Inductive Automation and Label Verification from Grantech. My name is Dave McKenna um, and we'll be introducing the others. Andy Abramson is here also from Grantech and Dr. Joseph Bomer, Professor and Director at University of Nebraska. So we do have a lot of stuff to go through. Uh, just a little tip about uh, webinars, uh, please. We, we've we've put some effort in to try and make this really educational. This is not meant to be just another of those vendor sales presentations. There's some uh, there's some good material here. There's some good lessons learned that we've developed over rolling this solution out uh, and some some great comments and feedback and, and challenges from our customers that we've got quotes that we wanna share with you as well. Um, so recommend it, don't get distracted, take notes as you need. We are gonna have a couple polls uh, and there is a chat as well. You can enter information in the chat and we'll be going through those kind of questions uh, towards the towards the end. So, so first, just really an introduction of what 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 what's the agenda? What are we going to go through today? So first, some some background and some starting points and some starting agenda, uh, and then some uh, who, who's here. Uh, we're going to talk about why to do this, and we have Dr. Bomer who's going to go into some of the health impacts and health effects and severities of allergens. Uh, some great information there, and and from a business side. You know why else do this? Then we're going to get into what it is, some some technical, some technology choices and trade offs and decisions, uh, how to execute this. And this is really, if you're a director, if you're a VP of quality, uh, even if you're just at the plant, how do you do this across an entire company? And what are some of the some of the lessons learned uh, that we want to share on this? And lastly, some real stories and real pain. So these are some of the challenges uh, that some of our customers have had and evolving business situations and, and sort of managing label verification. Uh, so to kick it off, just a brief kind of quick introduction. So my name is Dave McKenna. I'm director at Grand Tech. I've got 18 years of manufacturing experience in, uh, in industrial automation. I'm based out of Toronto. Um, I'm joined by Andy. Uh, Andy, 16 years. He's out of uh, Chicago, Illinois area, done a lot of verification projects kind of himself. Uh, and then again, we'll let Dr. Bomer, he's going to be talking shortly, so we'll allow him to introduce himself then. So quick working definition, so we kind of know what we're here and what we mean when we say label verification. So label verification, it's confirming that a product is correctly labeled. Excuse me, this includes all packaging components. So that's a, that could be a front label, a back label, a neck label, it could be a case label. So this is, uh, this is your salad dressing example, front, back, neck. Depending on the product, it could be different labels, but it's making sure you've got the right label on the right product. Uh, and how do you manage this? So you can have SOPs, you can have policies, you can have quality people checking that this is done properly. All those are possible. Um, they can they can break down. There can be failures that come from that. Or you could just miss one single package. You know, you've got a big roll of uh, roll stock. There's one wrong label inside that the packaging vendor created. How are you going to catch that? And the consequences of getting this wrong are significant. We're going to get into the, the impact of allergens. Uh, so that's what we mean when we say label verification, making sure the right labeling is on that product. Uh, and the advantage of this, this is really something that's been solved. There's technology that can fix this. There's ways of implementing that. And that's really what we're going to go through today. Uh, so we're going to kick off our first poll question. And this is really so we can understand a little bit more about you. Uh, know who our audience is. So please use the poll feature on the webinar platform. And the first question is, who are you? Are you a quality individual? Pause for laughter. Uh, are you in, from engineering capital projects? Are you someone in operations, maybe more of a business side, business unit manager, business unit leader, something along those lines? Are you a contractor or, or uh, another system integrator or other? You know, Who's here? Um, just so we, again, better understand sort of our audience and who's here. So we'll give a few moments to answer. And, okay, so we have a pretty decent mix actually here. Although I, I'm gonna say you're all quality individuals. Okay, perfect. So why verify labels? Uh, and at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Joseph Bomer. Thank you again for uh, for coming to join us and take it away, uh, Dr. Bomer. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm Joe Bommert. I'm a professor in the Department of Food Science and Technology here at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Uh, I also direct a program called the Food Allergy Research and Resource Program, so the FARP program, which is internationally recognized in the area of uh, research on through to 
helping companies and others manage food allergens. And so I've got over 16 years of experience in that research and outreach focused on food allergen uh, research, allergen management, uh, specifically working in areas of detection method and risk assessment and how we can translate that into practice in the food industry. So today's topic, I'm tasked with giving some overview of food allergens and really why we're concerned. And you'll see through this presentation that there's some critical areas that certainly food allergic individuals rely upon. And that's that package uh, and the label that they're reading to assure their safety. So let's jump into the food allergen risks that we see and how that can impact what we're you know, consumers that we're trying to protect here. So why is it important to the food industry? Why should we even manage food allergens? And certainly there's health risks that we'll talk about. There's definitely regulatory risks and that can all translate into business risk. So next slide. So with focus on the food allergic individual, I think it's important to put it in perspective. Uh, we think about a lot of these food allergens being nutritious products for a number of individuals, but for a certain subset of the population, these foods are essentially poison. They can cause various reactions we'll talk about that can be even severe and life-threatening, even fatal. So we're looking at about three to four percent of the population. Uh, tends to be a little higher in uh, infants and children with certain allergies such as milk and egg allergy. Uh, in adults somewhere between one and 2% of the population that have food allergies. Uh, we do see different prevalence estimates out there um, with some of them being as high as almost 10% in the children and adult population. So again, regardless of how we think about the prevalence um, and what the exact number it is, certainly these are a subset of the population that uh, definitely need to avoid these products. and allergen residues that may be in the product because it is uh, certainly life-threatening. Uh, we've seen some studies that talk about the burden of food allergens uh, and especially how much the cost contributes to a family with one child that may be food allergic and that's uh, roughly about overall in the U.S. somewhere around 25 billion dollars per year um, based on costs of such as additional care, additional selection of foods, perhaps, uh, maybe a parent staying home from uh, work because they're concerned about sending the child off to daycare. So that translates to about $5,000 per allergic child in a family. So it's uh, not inconsequential, and this is a, certainly a health risk we need to manage. You'll also see other elements here where small amounts can cause reactions, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And certainly, Without a cure currently, there's some treatments in development, allergic consumers must avoid these products. And that's where that label becomes critical in their avoidance diet. Next slide. So again, we can have mild to moderate or even quite severe and fatal type response with food allergic, uh, food allergies and allergic response. And it can affect a number of different uh, systems such as the gastrointestinal system, cutaneous or skin, respiratory symptoms, and all of those can combine to, uh, in addition to cardiovascular type response, where we can see the most severe type response of anaphylactic shock, where you're seeing multiple system or failures and so forth that can lead to those fatal type responses. Luckily, we don't often see fatalities involved, but nonetheless, one must be quite diligent to assure that you're not exposed to those high levels that can cause reactions, cause these uh, um, severe and fatal type responses. Next slide. So certainly the challenge with food allergic individuals are faced with is really that quality of life. I mean, if you can think about the last time you went to the store, how, how much of the label did you actually read? And that's what a food allergic individual is tasked with, taking the each product that they're going to select to purchase, reading that label very uh, systematically to assure that there's no allergens present in, in the ingredients, and that then they have to navigate those precautionary statements such as may contains and processing facilities and others. So they're very diligent in the matter of trying to navigate that food 
label and understanding what's safe, what's not. Certainly, that's a tedious job, so it can uh, certainly lead to anxiety, stress, sometimes social isolation uh, when they have to avoid certain situations like going to a birthday party or something of that sort. Maybe uh, hesitant in going out to restaurants because of the uncertainty of what may be going on. So again, it's critical that we provide them with the accurate information. Next slide. When we talk about the sensitivity of individuals and them reacting to uh, small amounts, you know, sometimes that's hard to put in perspective. So what we're seeing here is that uh, we have a diversity of individuals out in the population. In this case, penallergic individuals that we know can re react to as little as 0.4 milligrams of peanut. Some of the most sensitive individuals that we're aware of in, in clinical study. That's about one two thousandth of a peanut, if you want to put it into perspective. <clears throat> certainly, we have other individuals that have different degree of tolerance, so they certainly can tolerate higher levels, but nonetheless, certainly allergic and must avoid peanut. Next slide. And we do see that with other allergic uh, food allergies as well. Certainly, and there's a regulatory interest in managing food allergies, and there's legislation for clear labeling um, in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, and certainly a regulatory enforcement and oversight. So here I showed the reportable food registry in which if a company is aware that there's a potential for undeclared allergen, they enter into the registry for further evaluation by the FDA. And that can sometimes lead to recalls. But nonetheless, what we see is that food allergies tend to uh, be one of the highest causes for food uh, RFR entries. Next slide. If we take a little closer look at the entry itself, I show the registry for 2014 and 15, one of the latest years we have data on. Um, we do see food allergens being one of those high level contributors to the entries um, overall, uh, rivaling uh, some of the bacterial uh, pathogens that we see overall. Um, we do see these entries in various product categories, such as baked goods, uh, chocolates and confections that are contributing to a large number of these entries as well. Next slide. We follow and try to monitor FDA and USDA recalls and alerts, and we've done that for a number of years. This is our internal data, which you can see year over year, there's been a trend of uh, a, quite a few food related or food allergy related recalls, both from FDA, where we see many more products that contain or handle uh, different allergen profiles, less so in uh, USDA, FSIS regulated products, meat, poultry, egg, uh, but nonetheless, where we see some of those further processed products, we see some of those challenges as well. And these are all, again, preventable. So next slide. I think it's important then to take a look at what are causing these uh, food allergy recalls or associated recalls. Again, we see similarity in where we see some of those recalls. Um, this is data provided by Steve Gendel, who published. He was with the FDA at the time. Uh, we see some of the same areas that we saw with the RFR reports, so bakery and snack goods, candy, so forth. Allergens involved, not surprising, milk, wheat, soy. These are all commonly used in various formulations. So you have that opportunity uh, if things go uh, out of control on the facility. But importantly, where do we see contributing factors? What are the root cause for some of these different uh, recalls? And where we have sufficient data to assess that, uh, I think a lot of us think of cross-contact as that potential, where in re reality, we see pretty good uh, work within the industry to control cross-contact or shared equipment, so making sure those residues aren't present. We see a lot of the recalls associated with the wrong package or wrong label. So getting a product into a mislabeled package is one of the leading causes of food allergy related recalls and packaged food products. Next slide. Next slide, David. Ah, there we go. So, um, and this is, I'll just, won't belabor this point. We 
in addition to Steve Gendel's study, we took a dive into the data from what we could find in 2013 to 2017, and just to see if there were many changes in that time frame. Not unlike what was found, where we could find the data that helped us evaluate root cause, we did see where we saw contributors such as in incorrect ingredient statements, so labeling perhaps from the uh, supplier side, certainly wrong product in the package, wrong labeling at the uh, finished product side, and a few instances of cross contact as well. Next slide. And finally, because of all of these different challenges we see with food allergens, we see that with the Food, Modern food Safety Modernization Act, allergens have been elevated certainly in the importance and from a regulatory perspective, have a number of key areas uh, where you need to control food allergens, have that hazard assessment, organized allergen control program as well. And so allergens do take a central importance in the regulatory framework that we see here. Next slide. And lastly, again, we can handle this in a number of different ways through GMPs or good manufacturing practices on through to those more organized allergen control programs, prerequisite programs, and so forth. With these, FDA and the uh, through FISMA have really highlighted the need for controls to minimize cross contact, as well as highlighting the need to assure product label and packaging uh, uh, accuracy. So again, that was specifically highlighted within the uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act. So it's an area where certainly regulators are seeing that importance and seeing where the improvements could be made. So with that, I will hand it back over to David. Thank you very much, Dr. Bomer. I mean, to me, to know a one two thousandths of a peanut, that's that's not that's not a lot of. Uh, it's not a lot of, of a peanut or some of the products. So um, and again, thank you for sharing that information. And and that's really that we wanted to put kind of a, a health, a reality. Uh, I mean, the line that this is this is supposed to be healthy product that people are consuming to stay to feed their body and, and that it's literally poison for people if you get this wrong. Um, we wanted to put kind of a human side to this. And it's, it's really not just a business thing about the cost of a recall. Um, food is supposed to help you and, and, and not the opposite. Um, but there is also that business side to this. So um, it, it is a significant portion of recalls, as mentioned. Uh, and, and again, we, we searched some of the same FDA stuff. You are supposed to have controls on this. And how does this happen? I mean, it can be multiple ways. It can be vendor errors. It can be your operators. It can be your material handlers. It could be line clearance. Um, there could be uh, processes handling rework. Uh, you got temp workers coming in and out. Lots of plants supplement their staff with temp workers. So there's there's lots of different kind of ways this can happen and it's exacerbated depending on your packaging and, and your brand. A lot of packaging looks the same. I mean, there may be subtle differences to some of these things sometimes. Uh, and, and that makes it all the all the harder when you're in a rush and you got to keep the line running and you're running to grab that roll of film for the next. Um, and, and the other challenge on some of this is updates to label update up sorry updates to the labels and changes to the declaration and changes to the ingredient list. Now, how do you manage those different versions of packaging and make sure there's not some old roll of film that someone tucked in the warehouse that they brought out to this run that we're not supposed to use that anymore. So uh, label verification again can help with all this. Um, and, and what are the directs? What are business costs on this? You know, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have government, you're going to have fines, you're going to have fines from your, uh, from your customers that you're selling to your grocery store potentially or food service and they're going to find you per SKU and each of those customers is going to do a fine so that can start to add up you're going to have to deal with disposal costs and warehousing costs while you put product on hold to check the scope of this you're going to have to you're, you're wasting employee time you know your, your quality personnel some of your business leaders they're going to be phoning around you may have a war room with some of your senior people in it too and and again that's all time spent not doing other things that, that you really want to be doing as a company. And the last is, is a harder one and a, and a potentially huge, what's the damage to your brand? Uh, what's damage to your brand if, if people don't trust, uh, if, if you lose trust from, from incorrect labeling? And what are the lost sales? If you're barely keeping up with demand, and we've seen with COVID uh, and, and some of the changes in food and, and purchasing habits and customers and, and restaurants and food service, 
the demand is really swung. So a lot of our, some of our customers, they have products they cannot make enough. So if you have a recall and you're not keeping up with demand right now, you've lost that sale forever because you, because you're not going to get that back. Uh, and, and that's, that's a potentially even bigger cost. So there's, there's definitely indirect costs in addition to the direct, to the direct kind of obvious costs. Uh, and one, so one, one kind of nice story before we get kind of into how, how to do this and some of the technology side, uh, we've, we've had different customers, we had two different customers and they had significant recalls in 2014, 2016, or 2017, and this is hundreds of thousands of pounds or thousands of pounds of ready to eat product. And we install a system and there's been zero recalls at those facilities since that was put in. So again, this, this is a solvable problem. The technology can support your operators, can support your material handlers and your quality departments and people to kind of make this go away. Uh, so we're gonna do another poll. Have you had wrong packaging related recalls? Yes, in the last six months. Yes, in the last two years, no exclamation point or not applicable because I don't work in a food manufacturing facility. Pausing for poll entry, but stalling and talking to keep the white space and noise filled. Okay. Okay, so a few integrators in here, a few no's and a few yeses. So this is this is a real this is a real relevant one. So next we're gonna get into kind of what is label verification? So we talked about what we want it to do. We talked about salad dressing. You're checking that front, back label, the neck label, all the packaging components are the right things for what you're running at that time. So we're going to talk into how to actually do this. And I'm going to give it to Andy Abramson. Take it away, Andy. Thank you, Joe and Dave. Yeah, like you've talked about, you know, we've seen the health impacts now from improperly labeled material. And we've talked about the business impacts and that it's a problem that has been solved before. But, but what is that solution? So really it's as simple as label verification is using automated tools to check that the right pieces of packaging have been applied to the product. In reality, this means barcode scanners or smart cameras are put on the packaging line to verify that the packaging is what's expected. Typically either a product sensing photo eye or a registration photo eye on film will trigger a camera to take an image and make that verification. We prefer to read each and every piece of packaging because regardless of how good your processes may be, individual pieces of packaging could get mixed in upstream, maybe even from your supplier. Many times we're adding these onto existing lines and don't have the luxury of designing that perfect location for them. So we have to discuss and decide which location is best for all stakeholders. It could be a frame on a bracket over a conveyor or between a couple pieces of packaging equipment, maybe after a cartoner, but before a case packer. Typically that decision comes down to where is the product presented well and has the proper speed and gapping required. We may also have to consider things like upstream accumulation or not starving a downstream process when we decide on those locations. If the product is round and unconstrained and rotates, then you'll have to assess if you can read it inside a labeler while it's still captive, or will you have to do a 360 degree tunnel inspection to read the barcode um, and any orientation as it spins down the conveyor. So that's great if you're reading the product 100% correctly, 100% of, um, of the time you're reading that product correctly, but what do you do if you can't identify the product or, um, or you find the wrong product? These cameras generally work alongside a reject mechanism and in combination with a line interlock to stop the line if there's a wrong packaging present. One way we've seen many of our customers handle this is if they can't, if I, can't identify a product, they'll reject it from the line and continue running. If they can't identify three in a row, then they'll stop the line because this could be indicating either a malfunction of the system or an issue with the upstream process. Maybe they ran out of glue and labels aren't sticking or the packaging is mangled in some way. In either case, it's best to stop the line and assess that situation. If the camera ever positively identifies anything other than the expected product, then the line stops immediately and requires a supervisor password to reset. This should truly never happen. And if it does, we don't want operators sweeping it under the rug. We want to know how this happened and address it. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Dave. So how does a camera actually identify packaging? There's a variety of techniques and tools and each have their own trade-off. Across the top, we obviously have barcodes. Barcodes are absolutely the best solution for label verification. They're made specifically for this purpose and are fast and made for machines to read. Uh, the different types of barcodes are referred to as symbologies. A few different symbologies on the slide shown on the top there. The top two on the left are data matrix, which has kind of become the de facto industry standard for 2D barcodes for label verification. You can see the term 2D refers to the fact that it's encoded in two directions. It has both a uh, left to right and a top to bottom, whereas a UPC on the very top right is, is 1D because you can see it only goes in one direction, left to right. 
Usually data matrix barcodes are serialized and one of them is on each individual piece of packaging, like a salad dressing bottle would have a different barcode on the front, the back and the neck labels. Um, and typically the number embedded in those is uh, probably associated to a material number from the customer's ERP system. The difference with a UPC barcode, uh, you can see on the top right, is that the UPC identifies the product as a whole, not individual pieces of packaging, and that's usually what's scanned at the point of sale. UPC numbers on packaging are also are not generally serialized, so if there's promotional packaging or a logo change or an ingredient percentage change, that UPC may stay the same, whereas the data matrix barcodes would definitely change, and that can be important to many organizations to get that extra level of specificity. To the right of the data matrix barcodes is the QR code, which most of you are probably familiar with. The way to tell the difference is the three squares in the corners are used for orientation versus the two solid lines and two dotted lines for the data matrix symbology. Many packages may already have a QR code on them for smart label nutrition information or other promotional items and marketing will likely want to use those instead of adding a data matrix barcode to their packages. But these are really intended for someone to take a picture of on their phone, not for label verifications and their uh, label verification. And there's a few reasons why that's not a good idea. Same issue as a UPC, that packaging's uh, not specific, or sorry, that barcode is not specific to each piece of, pa each piece of packaging, but rather to the product as a whole. And then it will likely contain a URL, but may contain other data that's not consistent between packages. And it may be hard to know, um, or it may not be consistent as to how you're parsing out the relevant packaging data out of that string. And then the packaging artists usually uh, know to respect UPC and 2D barcode information, and that it should be on the same spot on every package because it's likely gonna be right on the line, but they don't have that same respect for QR codes. And they may not be in the same location for every product, for product to product or line to line, and may vary all over the place. And then in addition to that, data matrix symbologies were simply designed for this purchase, or sorry, for this purpose. And at many hundreds per minute, you'll just generally decode faster with a data matrix barcode than a QR, QR barcode. And there's many more symbologies like GS1128 that can be used for secondary packaging. Um, but in general, for any sort of barcode reading that we're doing, Grantech is gonna use Cognex's data product line, and then different models can read all or some of the symbologies kind of listed above. Now that's great if you have barcodes on your product, but um, there may be a circumstance where that's not possible. And on the bottom, you can see examples of solutions if barcodes are not available on your product. The bottom right, the two examples you'll see are for OCR and OCV. This is converting the actual alphanumeric human readable text into machine encoded data. It's far less reliable than barcodes, which are designed specifically for machine readability and contain checksums internally. OCV and OCR introduces the possibility of incorrect reads. For example, a six can easily look like a five or vice versa. And the difference between OCR and OCV, OCR is optical character recognition, where you have no knowledge of the expected characters prior to inspecting it and OCV is optical character verification. So this is more likely the application that you'll be using for label verification where you know what you should be looking for. The expected information is sent prior and you know what you're running and the camera, just, camera just verifies against the expected. Now this is important not only for um, read rates but then also eliminating character confusion such as zeros and O's, I's and ones, V's and U's. And then um, you can even further reduce that likelihood of character confusion by making sure you're printing with an OCR compatible font. So with barcodes, we can just point a camera at a product and it can probably find that barcode in any orientation or location on that product. However, with OCV and OCR, the camera must know to some degree the location, size, and font of those alphanumerics in order to be successful. Uh, just like with a QR code, packaging artists are not trained to put the alphanumerics in the same position on all packaging, and it's not usually in a consistent location on that line from product to product. And for that reason, we tend to see OCV, OCR applications more used for inline printing, such as uh, code date verification than we see it. Um, any sort of pre-printed label verification. When we do need to do an OCR OCV application, then we'll util usually utilize uh, Cognex's Insight platform with Vidi to make those inspections. But um, if you don't have barcodes, more likely than not, what you're gonna be going with is pattern matching. Um, the, the pattern matching is where you teach the camera a pattern or patterns that are unique for that product. And it looks for that product to confirm if it's correct. It's not reading the letters and deciphering the alphanumerics. It's just looking for a pattern, which it puts together as an outline of high contrast to low contrast along the image. Um, in the example on the bottom left, we've trained it for a shape of the letters peanut butter. When there's a peanut butter Grand Tech Bites label, it's a pass. And when there's a cheesy bites, uh, you can see it's a fail because it cannot find that peanut butter outline. You can see the red outline is what it was looking for. And the green outline was the expected pattern. 
one issue here is that depending on how many SKUs you have and the line speed, you cannot look for every pattern in every inspection. This means that when you try to find the pattern and you don't, you don't necessarily know if it's simply a miss of the product or an actual wrong label. You can't positively identify other SKUs like with a barcode when you're running it. <clears throat> so managing this does have to be done with care. We recommend against any point and train solution where you train the pattern based on what's front of the camera at the beginning of the run. Because if you trained on peanut butter and there's two kinds of peanut butter skews, now you can't distinguish between those two. And the system obviously doesn't have that knowledge built into it. The only proper way to do this is to train all of the patterns up front and cross-reference them against every SKU to confirm there is no overlap or confusion. Same process must be done then again for the introduction of any new product to make sure there's no crossover SKU confusion. Obviously, this requires a lot of manual effort, and pattern matching really is a stopgap uh, when barcodes are not available, but wherever we can, we'd, we'd obviously prefer barcodes. Next slide, please, Dave. <clears throat> So we talked about the barcodes and the data that's inside of them, but probably the biggest design decision is actually how do we know what we're telling the cameras is the right barcode is actually the right barcode. One of the main ways we've seen recalls in older systems is the operator brings out the wrong packaging, then presses a train button and the system verifies against that, or they type in the number that they have in their hand. And in either of those scenarios, it's already too late. They would just be validating against the wrong barcode source of truth. So. We know that we don't want operators telling the camera what is correct because that's been a source of trouble in the past. But then where should this barcode information come from? It can be automatically pulled down from the ERP system, but ideally, but does the ERP system even know which of the materials is which piece of packaging or what is passing under the camera at that exact moment? It can be downloaded the camera from a database that's main manually maintained by quality, or there could be an intermediate database that adds the necessary BOM information to, that, to what the ERP system may already know. So all of these should be considered, but the right answer is not an easy one and likely depends on how you use your ERP system. What sort of MES or SCADA system do you have available? Do you have an industrial data center that's virtualized? And do you have the network infrastructure to even support this? Back to you, Dave. This. We've talked through some of the some of the uh, design. You know, how do, how do machines do this? What are some of the choices in there? Now I'm going to talk on how to ex execute this across an enterprise. And a lot of this this next series is really a, a list of questions. You know, your your vice president, or or gosh, one day you will be uh, your vice president of quality or director of food safety. What are some of the questions and considerations that you're going to have across fixing fixing this problem across across the whole company? Uh, and the first one I'm going to start with, which is probably not something you see on a on a vendor or technology company presentation, but is leadership. Uh, one of the first things you need is how are we going to lead this? How are you going to lead this across the company? Is there a common playbook for this? And this is something we really stress. Uh, by common playbook, we mean a document that thoroughly describes what the system needs to do. What, what are the requirements? How rigorous does the LV system need to be? across the whole company. And this is something we really recommend and we help our customers write it so they understand what it's gonna do, uh, what are the business run rules for it, and um, and set that expectation across all their sites. So that's things like, what are we verifying? Are we are we acceptable? Is it acceptable to verify the UPC? Or, or we don't wanna do that because we're worried about individual packaging component risk or we're worried about version risks. Which, which packaging components need to be checked? If the, we're making salad dressing and all of our labels for salad dressing just has a logo, does that need to get checked? Or are we worried about things like light? You know, if that neck label says light and we don't have the, and it's not a light product or vegan or organic or no preservatives, you know, is, is there a risk there for brand damage? Uh, what are we gonna detect? What if we detect the wrong packaging, what do we do? And as Andy mentioned, this is really something that should never happen. So we we recommend line stop. But who's gonna who's allowed to restart it? Can the operator just restart on their own? Do they need a supervisor? Do they need a quality person to come and kind of authorize a restart and and investigate? Uh, these are all kind of decisions in this playbook. And what if the what if the barcode can't be read? And and that's going to happen some of the time. It's it's manufacturing. It's packaging. Things go wrong. Boxes flip over. Packages tip. Uh, cartons don't get closed properly. Jams happen. What do you do when this happens? Do you line stop? Do you just reject that? How do you handle rejects? How do you make sure you've, you've said you can't read a product so you couldn't confirm that that box or that salad dressing bottle, you couldn't confirm that bottle has the right pack labeling on it. You're gonna reject it. How do you make sure that it got in the reject bin? 
Are you going to confirm that things got in there? So there's no risk that it somehow the air or the air reject or mechanical reject failed and it went down the line. Are you going to lock your reject bins? And again, who can open them? So there's, there's many, many questions and little details. And we go through this with customers uh, with a lot of expertise that we've had and things that we've seen and learned on, on a playbook and, and all these decisions and choices. Uh, the last I think is another is some anti tamper stuff. And this is an important one that we embed into this playbook of, if, if someone's having a bad day and they want to keep the line running and there's there's products not being verified, they can and will disconnect the sensors that trigger the cameras or disconnect the reject system. You know, does your playbook handle some of these uh, tampering of lines or potential tampering of lines? There's a lot more to this. Then the next is who's leading this? Are the individual sites responsible? So say you're a company with multiple plants, are the individual sites responsible for this? Is this corporate led? Is corporate setting requirements? And then sites are implementing it. If so, are you going to get the same thing at all your sites? Are you going to have problems three years from now when you're transferring staff between facilities or you're moving lines between plants and nothing's compatible because it was all done by different vendors? That's something you need to consider and think about. And there's a big trend that, that we see in the industry where procurement is really site led and that's causing some, it, it's causing some behaviors where uh, potentially sites are putting in things that again, there, there's, there's missed opportunities to have something standard across the company. There's missed opportunities for corporate to know what's going on and be able to have an overview of all facilities. So uh, that's a, that's a concern that we see. And it's, it's something that again, there's trade-offs on, on either of those decisions. The next is co-packers. Lots of companies have contract manufacturers, contract packaging companies that they use. The customer, the end customer, and is not really going to care if they get sick from something that you packaged with your brand name on it or a co-packer package for you. So how, how are you going to handle that? And we've seen customers kind of take different approaches to this. Some of them have mandated co-packers install a specific system from specific vendors. Uh, and some of them have have more set it as requirements. So it's really the safety of your brand. It's it's you're within your rights to make it a requirement for your co-packers. And and again, some companies choose not to do that. Uh, the last is a couple others. What's in your in the network of your plant? Do you have brown a lot of brownfield facilities? Do you have mostly newer facilities? Are you building new greenfield plants? You know, do you do you want a standard solution that can kind of fit into any of these? And this has really been our our recommendation or uh, or are you going with a, a turnkey, you buy a system, it's got conveyors and image and cameras on it, but you know what, that's not going to fit in three of our plants because they're 50 years old. You know, these are considerations that you need to have when you're, uh, when you're starting this out and when you're planning this. And the last and important one, uh, quality management systems, policies, procedures, and updating people, training and stuff like that. And we've seen challenges from that. And I'll get to some of that when we talk to our, our real, real stories from real customers, real pain. There's, there's policy and paper side and, and processes that need to be put in place to make sure this is sustainable for, for going forward. Okay, so now you've, you've decided how you're gonna lead this. Where do you start? Uh, do you start with recalls? Do you start with facilities that have had recalls and areas and products that have had recalls? Do you start with plants with mixed allergens? And, uh, and the biggest one we see is lines with mixed allergens. So if you have multiple kinds of products produced off the same line and some, are, some have a certain allergen and some don't, that's usually the, the biggest bang for the buck and biggest risk, um, but not always. And products, what's the biggest risk? Where is there the most regulation on certain products that you do? I'm gonna say, uh, you know, two com significant comparisons, consumer products versus meat, you know, there's there's different levels of regulation on mispackaging any of those. And, and so where do you start? And so these are, again, things you need to decide as, a, as an enterprise, as a company, uh, and there's there's quality consultants that can kind of assist with, with this and with risk assessments. Uh, that we've worked with if, if you need that assistance. And so now you know where you want to start and, and you know kind of want to how you do this. The next big choice is the technology partner. And so there's there's a hardware component to this, there's a software component to this. And I'll say broadly speaking, there's there's two choices on this. You can go with an open hardware system or your black box. So open hardware is something where a barcode scanner, a, a, a smart camera, you, the cusp, the end user, the manufacturer, you can directly buy that from a distributor on your own. You can train your people from the distributor or from the company themselves on your own. You could find multiple contractors 
that can work with that on your own. And that's option one on the left kind of side. And we, we recommend Cognex. The other option is a black box. And there's vendors who have proprietary systems. They use their own proprietary cameras. It's got their own proprietary uh, hardware and you can only buy replacements and anything from them and that's it. And we, we highly recommend the left and that's really been our business model and something we firmly believe is the right choice uh, for, for customers. It gives you the flexibility to maintain your own plant. You can do your own troubleshooting. You can keep the lines running if there's a problem on your own. If not, you know you can call for uh, our customers call us for assistance. Some troubleshoot it on their own, or you can hire another vendor. You've got the choice. You're not locked into support contracts with only that one vendor, uh, and that's that's really why we recommend an open open hardware solution. But that's something again you need to decide. Another factor on this is food customers keep lines for a long time. This isn't automotive where there's a new model every four or five years and you rip a whole line out and throw it in the garbage. Things change. Um, food plants keep, keep their lines for a long time and you're gonna need to make changes and additions to that. So again, we really stress an open, open platform and we recommend, strongly recommend Cognix for this. And similarly around software, uh, there's, there's vendors with a black box. It's their own proprietary software that they have the code for and, and aren't sharing and aren't released. Uh, or you can use an open software system, again, where all the code is visible to you. You can train your people on maintaining it. And we recommend Ignition. Ignition is a SCADA platform or um, HMI, you may have heard HMI or SCADA platform for, for viewing automation systems and controlling them and collecting data from them. Uh, and Ignition's uh, great because you can put it in your plant and then you can add your control your label verification system with it, see it, monitor it, and then add other equipment. You wanna add check wares, you wanna add label printers to it, you wanna add uh, any any other, you wanna add a filler to it or a case pack or cartoner, depending on what it is, that's possible too. So this is something we highly recommend because it doesn't lock customers, it gives them flexibility, control for the future. And again, they can, um, they can maintain and troubleshoot kind of on their own with the correct training and, and the, right, uh, the right personnel that are capable of that. And so we've, we've got our hardware, our software, and I kind of, like we, we've talked through a lot of questions and design choices and, and program management choices for solving label verification across an enterprise. I really, really to, to sum that all up with kind of our approach, and this is what we recommend is, first is an education piece to this, really on knowing all these trade-offs, some of which we've talked about and, and making these decisions and documenting all that in a playbook. And then ultimately after that, there's an execution phase, which again, we, we strongly recommend uh, a system or solving label verification by bolting it into existing lines and existing conveyors and adding it in. It's not always the quickest thing to do, but it saves space and buying more space, getting more space in a plant, not easy. Once you lose space, that's that's a real hard thing to make up. So we, we go into brown facilities or greenfield facilities, but we recommend bolting it on existing conveyors, existing lines, inside fillers, wherever it needs to be. And there's a preliminary engineering phase to doing that and identifying how you're gonna do that, where you're gonna put those cameras, which side should the HMI be so an operator can see it. There's an execution phase, uh, afterwards support and, and kind of training. So that's our, that's our approach to this. So that again, starting from the beginning, you know what you're gonna get, you set a standard for it and then study and implement it, and then support and training kind of afterwards. So lastly, we're gonna talk about uh, real stories and real pain. So these are real quotes from customers, uh, things that they've learned, and uh, I honestly wanted to share this. I think it's some, some valuable information. So this is a customer first quote, some products are new to our facility and we are taking from another facility. So you can design the greatest label verification system ever, have everything tested and running fine, and then a new product is transferred in. This is something that, there's a bit of care to managing this. And again, we support customers afterwards. Uh, if it's a different kind of product, if it's a different shape, if it's square jar instead of round, if it has barcodes in a different spot, if it doesn't have a barcode, these, these are real problems. And, and the vision system needs to be adapted to handle this. And again, that's why we recommend open hardware to do this, but there's work to make sure these new products can run in the system and be verified. The plants were tight for money, so they went on the low side. SAP integration, all this higher level stuff, no money for this. So honestly, one of the challenges with procurement really being from a site level, some of these things that would benefit many sites or, or be an advantage to corporate, they, they don't, they're not happening. Uh, plant went for mechanical reject, created their own problems. Again, we would recommend air rejects. There's just so much less safety to deal with and guarding and 
it's simpler if it can work. I mean, you're not, you can't use it in all cases, but that's something that's, uh, it's, that's caused challenges at one of our customers. Packaging design group moved orientation and location of UPC. And I'll read the next two marketing, remove the 2D barcode. Uh, that one, when I found out about kind of blew me away that, that a company would commit to food safety on this, commit to managing allergens and verifying all their packaging. And then a packaging group can make these kind of changes where they move it around or take it out. Um, so that's, again, there needs to be some amount of flexibility built into these systems to be able to uh to adapt and to be able to handle changes that come the next evolution of this is now that we have all these systems we need to get help along the way i'm glad we have something in place for this to keep a blanket po and again we want our customers to have open hardware open software they can maintain on their own that's not always the case it's going to depend on on the staff at the facility the number of staff at the facility how much time do they have supporting the existing equipment do they have what, what kind of expertise do they have and if you can't maintain this, I think it's important to recognize that uh, and then set up a support contract or set up things for support rather than kind of waiting till you have a breakdown and then having to scramble to, to take care of it. There's an active project where they're, having a, uh, where they're having a separate project to look at no label verification, but seal inspection. We know integration controls can be done. We can tie into that dot, dot, dot. So this is something that, uh, that again, we're pretty excited about. When these systems are in place, you've got a screen on the plant floor, you've got cameras that are confirming the product, and you know what the product is supposed to be. So that lets you do, again, this is an advantage of an open system. You can add in other detections. You can add in defect detection. You can check that that jar lid is on properly. You can check that uh, the caps are on properly. You can check the fill level potentially. There's a lot of other opportunities, and this comes with having an open, flexible platform again like ignition and, and with cognex now we want the consistency from site to site some sites have a certain feature some have another feature it evolves as we go so this this is really the story of as you do one of these large enterprise-wide rollouts across many facilities it takes time and sites come up with requests and some of those are great requests that that are valuable to do and are valuable across other facilities. It's important to kind of manage that those get backported. You know, the, the first sites to go live really need to get some of those things brought back to them. And that's something we've seen. Uh, last, we have no visibility at the corporate level. I hear we have issues on occasion, but a lot of it is we don't keep up on the system as much as we want it. We have so much stuff going on without visibility, no one knows, then we just shut it off. So this again ties to reporting and governance and oversight on this. And there's challenge on on really making this all site-based. Um, the sites are responsible for managing themselves, but uh, there, there's there's comparison. You know, I'd love to build all this reporting where you can compare facilities, uh, do an overview and drill down into that. And again, it's a challenge when there's a limited or, or a different engagement model from corporate. So those were some of the very, very specific kind of things that have come up from customers with systems. Uh, now we wanna turn it over for questions. Just gonna adjust my screens here for a second and see when they uh, can pop in on us. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'm just gonna read these and then uh, then we'll choose the lucky contestant who gets to answer them. So what is the number one challenge sites have maintaining these systems? Um, I can take that one. Um, so probably one of the main ones, like you said, is changing products. They introduce a new size or they move the barcode and uh, customers don't always have that visibility into those changes until we get an emergency call that uh, that's something that stopped working because it's not looking in the right place anymore. And then the other probably main one is keeping things, um, keeping things in position and focused for whatever reason, maybe it's human nature. The first idea to try to troubleshoot a system is maybe to move that bracket or tune it like we used to in the old days, but they may not be accounting for, maybe maybe that was tuned to two different product sizes and you got it perfect for the one and aren't considering the second location. So keeping it kind of in the same location, I would say, and then ever changing products. Awesome, thanks Andy. So second question, what if a site has no network? Can we implement this? Uh, and I'll say, I'll say the answer is yes. I mean, we've put in systems with a, it's not ideal, um, but we've put in systems with a standalone kind of setup where it's all stored locally on one system. There's a, there's a screen or HMI there. It's storing all of the different bill of materials. 
uh, and it talks to local cameras on it and it integrates with the line to do a line stop and that's it. So it's possible to do that. It's again, it's not ideal. You, you're maintaining your bill of materials now at each of those standalone systems. So that's, that's again, not ideal, but if you don't have a choice, you don't have a choice and you're, you're limited from a reporting standpoint. You know, if, if all those are separate, you're not going to be pulling reports up to, to analyze all your lines and kind of get a dashboard and see performance, but, uh, but it is possible. Next question, uh, your slides showed controlling printers in ignition. How do you control the printer and verify that it's the right code? Then you're just verifying what you picked in the printer setup. Yes, good question. Uh, yes, if an operator picks a product and then you start printing that label and verifying what you printed, what if they picked the wrong thing in the first place? You're right. And, and we've had customers bring this up and what they were looking for was the operator picks the product, you run for a set period of time, they wanted five minutes, and then you stop the force of line stop. And then you have a quality individual come over and they have to authorize the restart of the line. So they're verifying that here's what's been printed, here's what I see on the line, here's what was selected. And if I go upstream and look at the filler and look at what we're running, then uh, then it matches what, uh, what it's supposed to be and authorize line restart. Uh, next question, kind of around pattern matching. Are your customers maintaining pattern matching on their own? Again, good question. So this gets to kind of this open hardware, open software. So some are, a reality is some are, and many are not. And it, and it kind of depends on the facility. It depends on the controls department, their strength, their, their, again, how many people they have, how much time they have, how stable that plant is. Uh, so some of them are doing it themselves and just some are not in a position to do that. Some many plants, the maintenance departments are very, very lean. This isn't something, and it, it also depends. So pattern matching, that's where you're training on that label. You're training for peanut butter or you're training for whatever. Some plants they have, they're just not, uh, a challenge for them is they're not doing enough of it, I guess. So if you don't change your labels frequently or you don't get new, new, new labels or new promo packaging very often, then you're not doing it, you know, like anything else, you, your skills are going to drop. You may forget how to do that. So it, it's, it's a combination of how frequently it is, how big the controls department is, what their level of expertise or skill is, and, um, and kind of from there. And that's the last question I see now. So again, feel free to use the chat. If there's any more questions, otherwise, we're going to say thank you very much for attending. Uh, there will be a re emailed uh, recording of this that we're going to be sending out. And again, any questions, uh, info at grantech.com. And again, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bermer, for, for coming to join us and for some allergy information. My pleasure.